So the technology that I work on is called deep brain stimulation or DBS, which is a system of electrodes that are coupled to something called an IPG or a battery that's implanted in the chest. Then you have a series of electrodes that snake up through, through the neck and then are implanted in different parts of the brain that are hypothesized to be malfunctioning. So it's currently kind of the gold standard treatment investigated for psychiatric disorder. Um, and there, as you can imagine, it's much more of an experimental treatment. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's generating enormous amounts of data that can be then about neural activity that can then be coupled to behavioral data like both experimental tests and the sort of data that our phones are collecting on us all. But that it exemplifies in some ways the kind of avant-garde or limit of the quantified self, what some scholars have called the quantified self, but the relentless subordination of all of human activity into um, data that is coming to exemplify many of our lives. Well, capital works by having to find ever new territories to colonize and turn into sites of value accumulation and exploitation. Um, so this is like, you know, this is like the dynamic behind things like the colonization of new physical territories, but it's also the dynamic behind the colonization of new territories of value that aren't geographic in the same way. Um, so if you think about the turn of capital to scenes of what, what Marxist autonomists used to call reproduction, that is things that happen not in a factory or in a traditional place of work, but that's women's work that happens in the home, uh, seamless, the gig economy, the sort of general move to contract works, uh, which is hyper exploitative, is happening in those new places, those new zones that we can think of as a kind of colonization. And I think that the opening of the brain as a site of very speculative value uh, production can be thought of in tandem with those other types of expansion to new territories. Notable features of this entire scene of research is that it is heavily invested in by the US military. And one line of Marxist critique uh, or just, you know, vaguely left critique or even liberal critique finds this alarming because, oh, like, we're going to make robot soldiers. So, like, this is how the internet was developed, right? It's, uh, it's, it gets this sort of militarized subsidy until it's at the point where it can be privatized. The question of how it can be valuable or if it's valuable is one that's very much getting, not only because it does the kind of, um, folds into the kind of, like, predictive algorithms that are selling us ads on Facebook all of the time, but because it might um, lend more manipulability to all kinds of other data that will like allow, uh, allow advertisers or whatever to like uh, more precisely target decision points. But the entire scene is very speculative. This is true. Jose Delgado was one of the most, like, most promising young neurophysiologists of his generation. As you mentioned, he spent time in Franco's concentration camps. He was, if not a communist, at least like a, you know, a Spanish Democrat. And um, he then got an award to study neurophysiology in the lab of John Fulton, who was at the time the premier neurophysiologist, kind of at the top of the field in the 1930s. He was at Yale with brain implants and electrodes. Uh, on animals to find the neurophysiological basis of things like rage, uh, aggression, hunger, sexual appetite. He begins saying things in magazines and uh, in public lectures like, well, neurophysiology tells us that as much as we, we might want to think that liberal ideals of self-determination or free will are true, actually it's not. Now, this is happening in the 1960s in Cold War America, where the idea of free will is at the basis of both liberal democracy and the free market, which is going to triumph over uh, the Soviets, right? And so um, there's a sort of fascination with what he's saying, but it also introduces a sort of moral panic, which is, by the way, exactly the same moral panic that greets B.F. Skinner, who publishes Walden Two. <laughs> Ethnographies work when you can spend time in the field with people who are willing to talk to you. And as you can imagine, 
um, there is a host of ethical considerations around working with populations, um, small populations of people who are so extremely depressed and who have failed every other type of mood uh, disorder intervention. And this, we're talking like ECT, um, analysis, CBT, several types of SSRIs, and MIOI. Like it's, it's a very extensive course of treatment and none of that has worked for them. And so then they are depressed enough that they um, want to try this exper extremely experimental brain implant that may or may not work. Is uh, like when you're scrolling Facebook, are you laboring? Are you um, the oil that a monopolist is extracting? Or like, how do we theorize why they want this data? And like, how do we, yeah, how do we, how do we approach that anal analytically? Um, and I think that the data as labor critique means very well, um, right? It does approach the scene saying, well, there's a form of exploitation happening here. And like, you know, how do we stop it? We know that it's not the same thing to like be a waitress as it is to be scrolling mm -hmm. Facebook. Um, but also data does not become valuable uh, at the individual level. So like there have been a variety of initiatives to try to reimburse people or make people the proprietors of their own data. Uh, like it only becomes valuable in, in at the population level, which can be achieved through either a state or through a monopoly. There, but definitely the forms of production that demarcate the economy now are not the same forms as were operative in the 1970s. So narratives about the subject have changed over that time. Now, part of this has to do with the rise of the so-called data economy, and part of this has to do with changing notions of what the self is. So now I think that there is a lot less, um, a lot less of a moral boundary around the naturalness of the subject. Uh, and this has everything to do with sort of how subjectivity has been reshaped by ideas about optimization and self-enhancement that have to do with the entrepreneurship of the self. Of power in a critique that recognizes a scene of labor that is not called labor as being labor. So for instance, I have been involved in graduate unionization, um, which is a big social movement here in the US. It's not all of the time that I would say it's not labor. I just think that you have to be very careful in your application of the analytic because it has real implications for what you're supposed to do about it to make it better. And so I think that misrecognizing scenes of labor or saying, well, value production is happening here, therefore, we have to reach for labor as the analytic, gets us into hairy territory. So for instance, um, the 1970s were marked in some senses by uh, feminist Marxist autonomy, um, which was, you know, I'm thinking like of Silvia Federici um, at all and that kind of that line of critique. And there, line was uh, they they had they mounted this campaign called wages for housework which was in many ways very inspiring very innovative and it was well capitalism also requires that um women be working in the household this has not been recognized sufficiently as a scene of value production so we demand wages for our housework so you see they're like it is labor and in some ways you could think of the rise of the, of the gig economy as being the answer to wages for housework. Like, okay, here are your wages, right? And demanding that you be included in the ruthless subordination of all of social reality to the regimes of quantification, time discipline, and uh, value production that demarcate labor, I think misses the other forms of exchange that anthropologists are looking at all the time that are not market exchange, that define how humans interact with each other. And I do not think that demanding that you be recognized or included in a labor regime, which is a very historically specific, very um, tightly defined actually form of labor, or I'm sorry, form of, form of exchange and social relation is necessarily always the move.
I think what is happening here is a sort of parasitization of capital on scenes of social life. Um, and perhaps laying down the sort of conditions through which something could become labor. So maybe, I mean, I certainly hope not, but it is possible that like several decades from now, the technology will be developed enough such that you, you know, you could get paid. Why don't you do your social life in our little platform that we've made through the forms of uh, e symbolic exchange, right? The like is like a quantification. It's a, it's a token that we give to each other, right? That's like why the introduction of the like button was like such a sea change in, in digital sociality. Um, but that in itself, you are still engaged in sociality in a way that capital is trying to parasitize upon and map. Our value production is equally about the reorganization of time and sociality as much as it is about the production of um, profit as such. Uh, so like, I think we can see the same thing going on here without saying that it is labor, which is like a very historically specific type of activity. I think that insofar as capitalism relies on, on the development of technologies, right? The history of capitalism needs the history of technology, but we also need to do a better job of articulating the explicitly political purchase of our work.